All right, very pleased that we edited the John Morganis video at the pertinent point there. You'll remember what I mean. All right, so day three today, and day three is Emerging Technologies Day. We have an absolute bumper session for you. So in just a moment, we're going to be joined by Jeremy Burton, who is our president of uh, EMC Products and Marketing, and my boss, along with Chad Sakach and uh, CJ Desai, really to kick off this session. We have a slew of special guests that are going to be joining on, on stage today. So they're going to be joined by Bill Moore, who's the president of our DSSD team, and Randy Byers, who many of you will know, who is uh, the VP of Emerging, Tech, Emerging Technologies Division. Um, we have a special guest panel with uh, Bev, with Kumar, and with Dietmar from uh, Intel, Verizon, and SAP. So very, very pleased to welcome them to EMC World this year. After the general sessions, we're running our final guru session. So this is the information generation guru session. This is going to be happening uh, today at 3 o'clock in Venetian F with Jake Paulway and Jason Silver. Don't miss this session. It's really, really going to be fantastic. The Beat Burton Challenge is still going. I beat Burton. Um, the good news is that Henry is, while still in the top 10, is no longer at the top of the leaderboard. But if you want to go beat Burton, then the challenge is still going on down in the village. Um, the, you've pumped a ton of water, ton of water. Um, you, I wouldn't say you did it, but you did a lot yesterday. So lots and lots of opportunity. Uh, 2,800 of you have already pumped water over the last two days. We've pumped 5,400 liters, and that translates to about 200, uh, 280 jerry cans of water. But definitely go down there. Obviously, we'll be matching all the donations from uh, down there. Now today, we're also going to be doing a huge giveaway. Anybody in the room would like an Apple Watch? A couple of people. Well, I can tell you, you should get an Apple Watch. Oh, I feel, I feel the envy. But what's better than one Apple Watch is, I don't know, two Apple Watches. All right, so I know it's very early in the morning, but commit a dozen characters to memory. Hash. EMC win a watch. Because we're not giving away one, we're not giving away two. If you commit these 12 characters, hash EMC win a watch to memory, 50 of you will get an Apple Watch. Woo! I know. By the way, if you're a member of the EMC Federation, you're not eligible for the dinner. Okay, so here's the key thing to get the Apple Watch. To get the opportunity to win the Apple Watch, you need to tweet hash EMC win a watch during the general session, and you need to be present at the end of the general session to get your watch. Finally, as a remi reminder, the Solutions Expo is going all today, so you're able to go and check that out until 5 o'clock when it closes. And then this evening, we'll be wrapping up with a huge party. Again, a first for EMC, having two bands on stage. Very, very excited that we're going to be welcoming uh, Fallout Boy and One Republic to the EMC stage uh, tonight at 8 o'clock. So with that, let's get this show on the road. Thank you very much.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our president, Galaxy Martins, TNC, Jeremy Bird. <laughs> Thank you, Illuminate. Absolutely fantastic. Um, let's take our mind back a couple of days. It's been two days already, so let's get back into the zone of where we were in David's talk on Monday and really start drilling down from there. We said 2020, only five years away. We're going to have 7 billion people connected to the internet. 30 billion devices, 44 zettabytes of data. And we can start to see that the journey towards that world has already begun. And we also believe very firmly that the key enabler for these devices and these new experiences is going to be software. That's really what Paul talked about yesterday. And these devices are forming a network that we call the Internet of Things. Now, when you, you, when you think about things, you think about a sensor, or maybe that's me you know, carrying my mobile phone, or maybe it's my car, but it could also be a cow. It's going to be one of those days. Smart farmers, believe it or not, are already connecting their cows to the internet. And in fact, the stream of data, believe it or not, coming off a cow can be 200 megabytes a year. Now, of course, nobody owns one cow, right? You have a herd of cows. An EMC world first, a herd of cows. Believe it or not, there are 2 billion cows in the world. That means by 2020, we could be generating 4 exabytes of data from the cows on planet Earth. That's another perspective on the Internet of Things. Now, the software that we're going to write to enable these devices, it's going to be very, very different. We've already talked about this, right? Millions on the Internet in Platform 2 to billions enabled with Platform 3. The data volumes, when I first came to EMC uh, five years ago, we had our first petabyte customer. And today, we've got over 1,000. In fact, today, we have our first exabyte customer. And I would tell you, by the time we get to 2020, I'll bet we've got over 1,000 exabyte customers. The way applications have been architected is fundamentally different. No longer is it a monolithic application and a single relational database as the system of record. We're moving to the world of composite applications microservices, many, many different database and data types. If you look at the development methodologies, certainly from an infrastructure provider like EMC, we think software in the new world is going to move much more towards open source, community-based development, a fundamental change from the Platform 2 world. If you look at the deployment methodologies, to date, everything has been VMs, and, and, and we've seen over the last year the rise of the lightweight Linux containers. So that promises to be a new deployment methodology. You look at the organizational model, waterfall-based development, ITIL processes, handing off to IT operations. The new world really is about agile development, continuous development and integration, and DevOps, the topic of our conference on Sunday. But we're not done there. If you look at the management model, you've got to consider your Platform 2 apps as being pets. And your Platform 3 apps being chickens. We're going to stick with farmyard animals all morning. You're going to love this. What do I mean by this? Well, think about it. When your pet gets sick, what do you do? You treat it with a lot of tender, loving care. You take your pet to the vet and you nurse your pet back to health. It's the same thing with your Platform 2 applications. The management infrastructure takes good care of those applications because those apps have to scale up and we have to protect them so that they can recover in any eventuality. 
Not so with Platform 3. If your Platform 3 gets sick, what do you do? You shoot it and spool up a new instance. It's a very, very different management model. So what we're talking about here is a clean sheet design. Today, we're not going to be talking about moving to kind of the Prius model of the world. We're going to be talking about going straight to the Tesla Platform 3 model of the world. And we think this is less of an evolution and much more of a revolution. And to drill down on these technologies, we said earlier that most of this world is going to be software driven. Not all, but most. And I'm delighted to invite onto stage a guy who I've known for many years and has always been one of the software guys, CJ Desai. So let's get started. Good morning. It's great to be here today. So, Jeremy talked a lot about devices and all the new trends, and a lot of talk about Tesla and Apple watches. You know, to be frank, I still haven't figured out what do I use the Apple watch for, all right? And so I was coming up with ideas, my next startup that I can do in part time. And I had a brilliant idea that I called myself. I said, I have a teenager daughter who is going to be driving soon. It would be a really good app when she goes over a certain speed limit. My watch gives me alert. When she goes to the areas that she's not supposed to go, my watch gives me alert. And my wife, you know, she gives me a lot of action items which shows up on my calendar. With this internet of things, somehow all of those get done. So that was my idea. Good idea? <laughs> so let's talk about some of the core design principles around the products that we are building in Emerging Technologies Division. I will go into details on some of them but software defined, scale out, using commodity. We do want to leverage open and next generation flash. So these are some of the design principles or characteristics that we are using as we build modern infrastructure for these applications. On scale out architecture, whether you have performance driven demands or file, or object, we want to make sure that for those applications, we give you choice. You want scale out block, start small. For a high performance database where you store metadata, you want capacity driven object, or for a certain type of file protocol, you want file. We want to make sure that we give you that. Analytics. So in 90s, a lot of talk about data warehouses. Nowadays, there is a lot of talk about real-time analytics. We want to make decisions fast. And we want information up to date. So when I look at that, so the analytics need to be built in. It cannot be bolted on. And the system, storage systems, need to support all the native protocols. It should be shared storage that can scale out linearly and should work with all the leading big data analytics application out there. Now let's talk about software defined storage. This is one of those words that gets overused. So last year, you had about 42% of storage capacity that was sold on commodity. But it only contributed to about 10% on the storage revenue for the vendors. What this means is, when you are at scale, you have a lot of unstructured data, whether that's petabytes and petabytes, all the way up to hundreds of petabytes. With software defined on commodity, you will recognize a lot of savings. Cloud aware, this is a given. The next generation object platform should be able to get data in and out of public cloud seamlessly and should support all the cloud stacks that are out there. So, 
So uh, on open source, one of these, this is a new thing for the division and new thing for EMC. Open source has been around. It started with operating system in 90s. Variety of applications, browsers, went through the route over the last 25 years. Open source is not seen as a risk. It is a development model where we want to leverage the community to bring innovation into the product. And last but not least is we have seen with scale out all flash array, uh, the great flash array we have, which is extreme IO, with innovation in flash, you can now scale out storage with compute. However, when you look at massive scale storage transfer system, which is highly scalable, you look at eliminating operating system overhead, you want to take advantage of flash media to do read and write, make sure cooling and everything is taken care of, you can recognize much higher performance than an all flash array will give you. So we are working on a next generation set of flash technologies, which we'll talk about soon. So these were the core design principles. I wanted to quickly touch on them. And let's talk about what's new. So the first thing I would say is we recently announced data lakes. And we have two product family, Isilon and ECS, as part of the Data Lake Foundation. So let's talk about Isilon first. Isilon natively supports all of these protocols. The data is already there. It's scale out. It's protected. It can linearly go as high as you want. And what we are seeing is amazing, amazing results with Isilon. We have now 6,000 plus customers globally, but most importantly, about 700 of them are using Isilon for analytics, running analytics workload on top of Isilon. We also had very recently, just in a single transaction, one of the largest deals, which was for 100 petabyte. And when you look at Hadoop shared storage, we are the market leader uh, in terms of uh, having Isilon capabilities. And on the scale piece, we just recently released HD 400, and you can have up to 50 petabytes in a cluster. And the new introduction to the Data Lake family is ECS. ECS is a cloud-scale storage platform that supports both object and HDFS. And we are very excited about the capabilities of ECS. The cost beats the public cloud cost. And we are really looking forward to customers using this product in the future. Now let's talk about software-defined storage. Uh, and specifically ECS, Scale.io, and Viper Controller. So when I look at the announcement we made yesterday, which we'll talk about in detail soon, Project Copperhead. This was a historic moment for EMC. We open sourced Viper Controller, and that project is called Copperhead, where community can contribute and bring innovation in the product, and the commercial version of that will be called Viper Controller. In addition, we are working on the next release of ECS, which has amazing features when it comes to geo replication, improved performance with geocaching. We have made the product easily deployable and to be able to scale out to hundreds of petabytes. I'm going to spend a little bit time on scale IO. On scale IO, you know, this is a software defined block storage solution. And when you look at Scale.io, we have had a phenomenal success last year. Many large enterprise customers, uh, service providers are using Scale.io to run storage on commodity hardware. Now, what's so great about Scale.io? So first, it is flexible. It can run on bare metal. It can run on multiple hypervisor. So it is very flexible, whether it's VMware, Microsoft, and others. It can run on that. Number two. As you add servers, these servers help you with processing I.O. and hence the scale out is linear. So as you start adding servers, the performance you get scales linearly. The design point has been parallelism. And that's why there are no choke points as you start adding hundreds or thousands of servers for scale I.O. And the next thing I would say is, so we 
did a study on Scale.io. We looked at attaching PCIe uh, to the server, and we were able to get 220K IOPS on one PCIe card. We started multiplying that up to 28 of them, and you had very, very high performance. Then we went to 100, 125, and you get the math here. So whether you look at the reads, reads and writes, or just writes, the performance of Scale.io with its design point scales linearly. Next thing is I get a lot of questions about Ceph. Hey, CJ, how does Scale.io compare to Ceph? What's going on here? When it comes to block, Ceph is still block storage running on top of object. So when you make a block request, it results in a transaction that results in multiple I.O. requests, and hence the performance is very, very low as compared to scale I.O. Number two, Ceph is very resource intensive. It takes high CPU percent points to run, and it requires higher amount of memory. And third, Ceph is very complex to manage. So what happens is you need a PhD in Python before you download it, and it's doubtful that you can get it working. Whereas with Scale.io, you can get this product running very, very fast. So when I'll talk to some of you, I'll say, then why did you download Ceph? Why did you work on Ceph? And almost the answer is, CJ, it was freely available. When I go to download Scale.io, I don't know where to find it, what's going on, and then it asks me a lot of questions. It's time-bound, and that process takes too long. In this new world, as Jeremy said, we want to make sure that our software, the storage software, is available freely and as frictionless as possible. So we announced yesterday, again, historic moment number two, we announced yesterday that Scale.io will now be available freely by end of this month and for unlimited time. And you can play with it as long as you want. And the software will have community. You can get all your questions answered. And there you go. So this is a big, big change compared to our previous stance. And this will be going live by end of this month. Some of the scale I.O. features which are scheduled for the later part of the year. Number one, we want to make sure that it's highly available. If you have a scale out system, high performance block, we are doing a lot of innovation around non-disruptive upgrade to make sure you can seamlessly upgrade software when you try to bring a, ser a server down, rebalancing of data and other features. Second is security is imp important in this platform three world. So we'll have support for IPv6, network encryption, and some of the other features. And what I'm excited about is for disaster recovery, we'll also have integration with Recover Point as we announce uh, this product towards the second half of this year. As you saw in David's announcement on Monday, uh, super excited about VX Rack, our collaboration with the VCE team. You can start at a quarter of a rack and scale up to thousands of nodes. That's the power of Scale.io, and that's why we are very, very bullish on this product and what, it's, what it will be able to do. So you look at all the announcements you know, around Data Lake, new release of ECS coming out, Scale.io, Wiper Controller going open source. We also have two new product announcements. At last EMC World, we just announced DSSD. So we'll go into the details of DSSD product and also Project Caspian that David had announced on Monday. So before I do that, I'm sure all of you are wondering, hey, CJ, you know, these are a lot of new technologies. We are trying to create new products, a new platform. How do you do that? What kind of engineering team you have? So first thing I would say is, over time, EMC has done a great job, whether it was getting a team that helped build Azure in 2012, whether it's having Scale.io acquisition in 2013, whether it's DSST and cloud scaling in 2014. What I'm today excited about is we just hired somebody from Apple it's his first day today. On the stage, I would like to welcome Josh Bernstein, who is joining EMC and Emerging Technologies Division today. Thank welcome, you, Josh. CJ. 
great to have you here. Great to be here. All right. So, Josh, my first question is, give us the scale of what you built at Apple and tell us for which application. So, um, it's a great question. Apple has huge scale. We were probably in the 50 or 60,000 node range uh, for Siri. Did you just say 50 to 60,000? 50 to 60,000 nodes, that's right. Okay, all right, just making sure. And a lot of learning lessons? Uh, we learned all kinds of stuff there. I mean, when you go big, um, everybody's very excited about getting their Apple Watch. Um, so we were challenged to build an environment to support that kind of product. And I told you before, I'm still not convinced on the watch. Thing. I know you're still not convinced. Okay. Sec second thing is, uh, tell me why EMC from Apple? I get that question a lot. I think that uh, EMC and I think that the, the uh, industry in general is on the verge of doing something really incredible. EMC is incredibly well positioned. They have incredible products. And I think they're really at the verge of making a dent in this industry and really supporting their customers and doing a phenomenal job. And so I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to participate in that. And uh, I'm excited to drive that forward with you. Excellent. Thank you. Welcome to EMC. Thank you. So we talk about bringing great engineering talent in the EMC. And as we talk about Project Caspian, you know, around last summer, uh, EMC acquired a company called Cloud Scaling. Randy Bias, the last time I checked, he still has the highest number of Twitter followers. And Chad needs to catch up there. Um, so Randy Bias was on the OpenStack Foundation board. He was the founding member. We are very proud that he's part of Emerging Technologies Division at EMC. And I would like to welcome Randy Bias on the stage. Please give him a big round of applause. Thank you, CJ. Well, it's really great to be here. This is my first EMC world ever. Um, so it's pre been pretty exciting. And um, I uh, have been learning a lot talking to folks, reporters and analysts. And uh, I'm really excited to talk to you today about open source and OpenStack. <clears throat> so just by way of a little bit of background, uh, I was previously the CEO of Cloud Scaling. Cloud Scaling, I like to think, was the number one in building production grade OpenStack systems in OpenStack land. And I also sit on the OpenStack Foundation Board of Directors. So cloud scaling, you know, one of, the, one of the ways that I know that we were very successful before EMC took us out is that we had two major deployments for two of the Fortune 15 that were about 20 plus racks each. That's a very large deployment in OpenStack land because it's early days. Um, and we learned a lot in those experiences. The other thing about cloud scaling that you should know is that it was a 100% open source solution. So our customers were demanding open source, they were demanding commodity hardware, and so it was really interesting when EMC came in and said, hmm, we'd like to buy you. I said, EMC, cloud scaling, kind of, how, how does that equation work? And, but over the course of a very short period of time, a week or two, I realized that EMC actually sees that future and wants to get there. So today, I'm really excited to talk about EMC's first forays into open source. So the challenge as I came on board at EMC um, was helping people understand what open source was about. And I ran into a number of challenges right out the gate where people were thinking about open source in terms of being software or free software or a particular op uh, kind of license, the open source licensing model. And it took me a while to get it across to folks to help them understand that actually open source is about three key things, at least in the minds of uh, the open source consumer, the enterprise consumer. One, community. Two, control. And three, vendor neutrality. So we're entering into a new era. And what it is is that customers who are adopting new technology platforms, they want to know that other people just like themselves are around the table, that they're having the same kinds of problems, that they can engage with them in, in public forums like bug tracking systems and IRC and you know, the places where developers go. 
they want to know that in terms of control, that if the features that they want on the roadmap for an open source project aren't there today, that they can actually directly influence that, that they can hire their own developers to contribute code back, that they can hire outside engineering firms to help them put those features in, and so on. And then finally, you know, time and time again, as I talk to customers over the last several years, they want vendor neutrality. They want multi-vendor solutions. They want to know that if one of their vendors doesn't work out for them, that they can let them go and replace it with another vendor. Now, that might be scary to some businesses, but to EMC, it's an opportunity because we know that we win on innovation and on customer service, and we'll continue to do so in the future as well. So, as you might expect, there was a ton of resistance um, at EMC to um, open sourcing our first open source product. However, what was amazing to me is that once we pushed through the resistance, the EMC execution engine just kicked right in. You know, people were, had really internalized what this was about, and we're really going to try to do it the right way. So that sort of brings me to the punchline, which is that, you know, historically, in the Federation itself, VMware and Pivotal have actually been very, very active in open source software. They have multiple open source software products um, and have been leading the way. And it's really great that today, EMC proper is joining the party. So, what do we open source? Well, we could choose to do some little thing. You know, we've already got some drivers up in EMC code, but we wanted to go big. What product do we have that's already multi-vendor, that we could get a community going around immediately, that we can give customers control by, allow, by making it open source as quickly as possible, that is already a leader in the space? Well, as I looked through all the options, Viper Controller rose to the top. So we really focused on Viper Controller in delivering a fully open source version of Viper, Con Viper Controller this year. Viper Controller, for those who aren't aware, is the world's number one software-defined storage controller. It has a number of northbound APIs that plug into all the variety of cloud stacks that are available today, as well as a bunch of different southbound APIs that plug into a bunch of different storage systems, including non-EMC storage arrays. And the great thing about this is it's already an extensible framework, so as we open source it, pretty much anybody can be part of the party with us. So you probably saw the announcement yesterday from Project Copperhead. Very, very exciting. You know, the first EMC open source product ever. Um, and I was directed very, very clearly by CJ to make it, to, to be, to help people understand that this is not the last. It's the first, but not the last. We are going to do more. We believe in open source, and we believe that it's part of our future. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to CJ, who's got a special guest panel that's going to uh, tell us more. Thank you, Randy. Hey, Bill. See you. All right. So it's me again. So let me introduce my guest panel. We have Belle Frere from Intel. She's Vice President and General Manager of their Storage Division. We have Dr. Dietmar Reinelt. I tried to pronounce it many times. Uh, VP of Infrastructure for SAP. Took a long flight to be here with us today. And then we have Kumar Vishwanathan from Verizon. You can talk to him about any complaints with your cell phone service or bills right after this. But He's a VP and Chief Technologist at Verizon. Glad to have you here. So I'll start with you first, Bear. So tell me the Copperhead announcement about open sourcing Viper Controller. What does that mean to you? We've been working with the industry for a while, um, talking about the software-defined sto storage controller environment. And it's been really clear um, from end users that they require an open, interoperable, heterogeneous management infrastructure. So uh, getting Viper open source, getting Viper controller open source gives us the opportunity to really accelerate that controller infrastructure. So we're really excited about what EMC is doing. Excellent. Dr. Dietmar, so you have been using Viper controller, one of the early adopters for us since day one. And thank you for that. Um, when you heard about us open sourcing Viper Controller, what are some of the first thoughts that crossed your mind? 
Well, if I'm honest, first, I was surprised. I was surprised that you really did it, but it's the right thing to do. It removed one of the biggest challenges or concerns we had when we moved to Viper in initially, and that is that we would be vendor locked in, we would lose speed of uh, innovation, and we would potentially have challenges with keeping up and giving us the choices to use the storage solutions we need. So it's the right thing to do. You did yeah. precisely correct. Thank you. <laughs> so Kumar, you have a big role at Verizon. Tell us, as you deliver Verizon's, one of the applications you have told me about is the VZ backup. But as you build this next generation applications that could scale to hundreds of millions of users, what are some of the design points you are looking at for the overall infrastructure? Sure, so if you take a step back, um, all of our applications were built in silos. You had silos all the way from the application to the operating system to the hardware. And you know the silos create hardware standard capacity. It creates operational nightmare for our, our operations team to have to go maintain so many different versions of it. So the whole goal was to drive from what we call redundancy-based fault tolerance to resiliency-based fault tolerance, which is you need to have a homogeneous layer at the bottom, commodity hardware driving to uh, commodity, uh, get all of our software into chunks or Microsoft or chunks like containers that we can start deploying at scale and uh, really run our uh, application. And again, we picked the application that had the biggest impact, which were petabytes of storage, and we decided to start playing with it rather than pick a small one. So the goal is to completely move from silos to data centers, data centers that are distributed across not just one physical location, but multiple locations. Right, so much more distributed architecture. Absolutely. Okay. So, Bev, coming back to you again, uh, with this Copperhead announcement around Viper Controller, what can, how can we work better with Intel? What can Intel help us uh, in getting industry adoption? How do you think Intel contributing to Copperhead? So Intel's been working, of course, in the open source industry for 20 years, yeah. right? Uh, we have a, a huge amount of work that we do in the Linux kernel and in OpenStack and a, a lot of the other uh, open source infrastructure organizations. Um, and what we will be doing with the software-defined storage controller space is really working on open interoperable APIs, those southbound and northbound APIs. Um, we're really excited to, uh, to work with Copperhead and to, um, again, continue to move forward that open interoperable standard space for storage controllers. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your partnership. Coming back to you. Uh, so you have been using Viper Controller in production. Now we just open sourced it. Um, and you know, hopefully, community pretty soon will start contributing. SAP's role, how you change, uh, think about your storage infrastructure now, given this announcement, and how would engineers from your team would contribute to controller? I mean, first of all, it, this announcement perfectly fits, in, fits into our overall strategy of having an open environment to manage yep. our heterogeneous storage landscape. As much as you probably would like to yeah. have only EMC storage in my data center, it's never going to happen. It's always going to be extremely heterogeneous. SAP embraces open source. OpenStack is a, we are an active contributor to OpenStack, and I'm pretty sure we are going to be able to share our experience with the community to maybe even actively contribute. And last but not least, also to work with our suppliers, our partners, to jump into that and build exactly the big community we are and you are looking for so that we have all the new fancy storage solutions in that community and have the ability to have the choices we need to pick the right solution for our services. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Kumar, uh, last question to you. So sure. when you looked at your applications infrastructure, and I know that Verizon has a very ambitious plan to scale it further over the next couple of years. Uh, tell us about a couple of technologies from EMC that you liked, and what was your experience with it as you worked with the engineering team? Absolutely. And um, I think you mentioned in your talk that some of your technologies are difficult to find, like Scale.io, and you had a nice chart about Scale.io versus Ceph. We actually went through that complete uh, journey. We started with trying to pick certain open source pieces, trying to make it fit. But frankly, we've been working very closely with uh, ECS and Scale.io for the past few months. 
And uh, we actually picked some of those builds on early alpha, have been running the software in our labs. And quite honestly, I think it's been a mutually beneficial relationship. Some of our use cases drove a lot of uh, different testing on your side, but we learned a lot about the software-defined storage on our side on what we should do on commodity hardware, what we need to take advantage of, what we need to be wary of. And quite honestly, this open um, collaborative development has been very beneficial to us and in, in my team. Excellent. And you know, in talking with uh, Josh at Apple, when I talked with your team, it's also a reminder for these kind of application, the continuous development and continuous integration and both teams working together is absolutely critical as you scale out your entire environment. Absolutely, because if you really think about it, we are talking about the, uh, if you're talking about containers being deployed in the data center, the containers can fail over from one machine to the next, from one data center to the next. You talked about geo-redundancy. All of those features, I mean, there, there is some amount of work to be done for us to get that, and we, are, we have been working to take advantage of that as we launch, because when we move the petabytes of storage, we obviously want to leverage everything that you do on your geocaching, geo-redundancy, all the way up to how you scale from few terabytes all the way to hyperscale. Makes sense. So, Bev, last question for the panel. Um, when we announced this, or we told you about open sourcing our core IP on controller, were you skeptical? Open source is hard. Going from closed to open source is hard. It's a hard thing to do. Um, but I think that as long as we keep in mind that end user value of making sure that you can manage a heterogeneous environment and, and, and really engage that controller across the infrastructure, we'll do fine. Excellent. So big round of applause to the panel. Thank you. And back to you, Randy. That was fantastic, CJ. Thanks. Uh, for, to you and all the rest of the panel. And that last part reminded me of the, of the um, could we back up a slide, please? Um, that last, um, uh, uh, the panel reminded me of the, um, uh, of the panel that we did on Monday. And we had about a full room, and I asked everybody in the room, you know, raise your hand if you uh, were expecting EMC to announce an open sourcing a product coming into EMC world, and I got one taker. Um, and then I asked the room, I said, you know, how many people think EMC is going to be successful at, you know, building and launching and running an open source project? And I, and I got most of the room. And I was surprised, but it was a testament to EMC. And although I helped sort of drive organizationally some of the changes um, and the initiatives around Viper Controller, there was a big crew of people at EMC who actually did all the work. I just basically made all the noise and broke all the glass. Um, so let's give them a round of applause to the EMC team that got Viper Controller open source. Thank you so much. So switching gears a little bit, but still in open source land, I thought we should talk about OpenStack. Um, if you haven't heard of OpenStack, I'm sure you will, or you're going to hear about it now at least a little bit. OpenStack is an open source project that was designed to be a, a clone of Amazon Web Services. It's about five years old now. It's the fastest growing open source community in history. There have been over 3,000 developers that have committed to OpenStack. There are 400 plus, maybe even 500 plus companies that are deeply involved with it. Uh, the folks on the board, uh, on the OpenStack Foundation board, or who are members, um, who are gold and platinum sponsors, is a who's who's list of the industry, Cisco and Dell and EMC and uh, Red Hat and Canonical, I mean, it's just really a laundry list of all the major players in, in, uh, in the enterprise world. People are using OpenStack today to really solve a key problem around the third platform, which is that they've got next generation applications, they're moving towards a DevOps model, they're trying to figure out how to have a, a lower cost basis for those applications and a faster, more nimble iteration, and OpenStack is really the centerpiece that people are using in their data centers to modernize them and take them to the next step. So to this day, EMC has actually been very uh, active in OpenStack land. Of course, VMware is number six contributor. Uh, EMC proper is also a major contributor. We have a whole bunch of drivers and plugins on the truck. We have a bunch of solution ar uh, s uh, reference architectures and solutions that we're able to help customers with. We're working closely with partners like Canonical and Red Hat and Mirantis on those things. 
Um, and then, of course, Viper Controller and Copperhead, Project Copperhead, plugged directly into OpenStack as well. So there's a whole bunch of stuff on the truck uh, today for OpenStack. But we asked ourselves, you know, if we wanted to take this to the next level, if we wanted to help our customers adopt OpenStack and really be very successful, what are the requirements? And we came up with four key areas. The first is we needed to build something that would be scalable or, or nearly infinitely scalable. You know, you start with 100 racks, you grow to 100. When I was at cloud scaling, every customer wanted to get started with OpenStack, but they wanted to start small. So you've got to be able to start small and grow big. Second, you've got to focus on the third platform. Systems like OpenStack are predominantly designed for those next generation applications. They don't really make sense for the old world. That's still a hard thing for people to see, but when I see successes in, in today's OpenStack appointments, it's all focused on third platform. Third, we want to deliver something that's hyper-converged. Customers want it to be you know, an easy, turnkey system, but they also want to disaggregate compute and storage. They want to be able to scale compute and storage separately. They want to have a lot more flexibility. They don't want you know, these kind of hyper-converged solutions that you've seen to date, which are software-defined, but are very, very rigid in their deployment models. And then finally, they want to be easy. They want all that operational goodness of the hyperconverged model. They want to have an open and transparent system where it's all open source software. Um, and they want to be able to you know, do the day-to-day -day operations in a, in a relatively effortless manner. So you probably heard about this, but today, or recently, this week at least, we announced Project Caspian that we're going to do a sneak peek of it today. And so I'm really excited that we'll have Chad Sakach on the stage here in a few minutes to basically run us through that and to show you what uh, our response and our answer to those four requirements for customers embracing OpenStack is. And in order to get us to Chad, I'm going to tee it up to Jeremy, who's going to uh, take us there. Thanks, Jeremy. It's a 24-7, 365 world. Always on. Always connected. Always stressful. How do you keep up, stay healthy, and reduce stress? By staying connected with Meta App. When you're on the right track. Great job, Jeremy. Keep up the good work. And when you're not. Chad, you said you were quitting. When you're eating right. Healthy choice. Great job, Jeremy. And when you're not. I need to just drink wines. Chad, I'm really worried about you. Oh, well. When you've made a healthy choice. Goal achieved. Score. Meta app, new from Novium Health. When you want to change. Too much big data, not enough big donuts. Ladies and gentlemen, Chad Sakic. Jeremy, I didn't see you there. Hey. Or these people. Chad, um, I got to talk to you about your lifestyle choices. What's, I don't understand what you're talking about. Well, I am on the board of Novium, and um, we've got some big issues, but you might be our number one issue. Uh, but more about that in a second. Just come from the board meeting. Three things that we need to do in the next 30 minutes. No problem. Number one, our Mediapp. You know, you see that Apple Watch application, it is going great. We have thousands of customers. We think it's going to go to millions. We need to scale our infrastructure. Elastic infrastructure, got okay, it. That's number one. You got that? Number two, we're buying a company. We're going to migrate their back office over onto our infrastructure. Now, I'm sure that this acquired company uses the same technology stack that we currently have, right? Yeah, no. Okay, they great. They use KVM on Linux. And we are Windows and VMware. Fantastic. All right. So that's not all. Third, we're going to get into the realm of big data analytics. It's a huge opportunity, Chad. We've got to build the infrastructure. Jeremy, I got your back, buddy. OK, you got that? Piece of cake. All right. So let's talk about how we're going to solve the first problem. We need to be able to build an elastic infrastructure to support that app. And this is a technology preview of what we've been working on with Caspian. OK, this is Caspian. You're logging in right now. Right. So the first thing that you need is you need an elastic physical infrastructure layer. So as I go in and I take a look, I can actually take a look at the physical infrastructure. So here we have racks, 
bricks, and nodes. And just visualize, these are just industry standard servers, very similar to the VX rack hardware that people saw on day one. Now, let's see. I'm just going to blam in and say, okay, we want to have one full rack here. And, and, and that's it. It's, I mean, it's that easy to go. Go and select. Now, I think that we might actually need more. So I'm going to say I'd like another rack, and you can see the physical capacity increases. And now I'm going to say I want to deploy. And what you can see is it's deploying all of the OpenStack components. That's it. Because I was led to believe this would take weeks and months. I have worked with customers that have been working on OpenStack deployments with very smart people for 18 months. Like Randy said, we need to industrialize it, make it simple and easy, but also still elastic. OK, fantastic. So now if I go to the dashboard, you can see that we've got the capacity deployed. But frankly, the infrastructure no is just the first part. We're going to go in and really start to look at the power of these Platform 3 applications. I'm going to actually use uh, this to create and push, do a CF push to push Medi app uh, up into the infrastructure. So it's a Cloud Foundry app running on top of our racks. Exactly. Ultimately, this actually creates small containers running inside the Nova instances, and it could actually do it on the bare metal as well. So now we actually see the instances starting to run up, power up. The users are now starting to create the load on the web front end and on the app nodes, and you can see that the load is increasing. All right. Fantastic. So it's still increasing. It looks like it's fine. You know, don't worry about it. This is good. This, the purpose of the beta is Chad, to increase the load. It's still increasing, Chad. We're going to be in no, trouble it's here. It's fine, man. I don't told you, we're going to be wildly successful with this app. Well, I'm starting to get a little bit worried. Chad, red is bad in any data center. Right. So we're getting an alert here that says, you know what, we need to have more capacity. So it's as simple as going in and saying, I need some more physical infrastructure, expand out the OpenStack components onto it. And boom, we have more. We've demonstrated here this concept of elasticity at the physical layer. Now, that's just the infrastructure, though. Surely the app, we have to go do something similar there. Exactly. Now, again, the power of these third platform apps is that you can actually just issue a CF scale command and say, I want an additional 350 instances of the actual code. Boom. Done. And you can see that now the load is increasing, but it looks like we've kind of hit the sweet spot for the current state of the beta. OK, we are back under control. Right. And the last part is we can actually take the information from heat, celiometer, and start to offer customers the ability to have better visibility into their consumption mm. of their pure Platform 3 so apps. So maybe as we build out a range of apps, we can charge back the business units for the infrastructure that they consume. Exactly. So first problem, solved. First problem, Done. Solved. Done. All right. We've scaled our infrastructure to potentially millions of users. So why didn't you so, so net this out for me? How could you do this with Caspian? So Caspian? is designed to give you that elasticity at the physical infrastructure. We've developed some amazing technology to leverage industry standard hardware, make it elastic and easily provisioned. Number two, we took OpenStack, something that was a great open source project and everyone's contributing to, but is complex to deploy and made it very, very simple. And to be clear, I mean, although the design point is, you know, uh, industry standard Apache OpenStack, potentially it could use any OpenStack, including even, you know, VMware. VMware VIO for customers that are going down that path. So again, this idea of federation choice. And then the last part that I think is perhaps the most important, you could hear from Josh, you could hear from Randy. It's about elasticity ultimately at the application layer. And we demonstrate how it's designed to be a simple and easy way to deploy Cloud Foundry on or off premise to give you that elasticity. Okay, so problem number one. Tick. Done. Done. About that acquisition. I am really worried about this because that's the number one issue with acquisitions is integration of systems, and it doesn't sound easy. If only we had a freely available, easy, elastic transactional storage model that could basically power an open environment with both VMware and with the Linux KVM environment. Mm, let me have a think. You got one right there? I ah, sure do. Scale.io. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to log into the Scale.io UI. Hang on. And what I've configured here is you can see, see the dashboard. Now, first things first, I know that not everyone here knows about Scale.io, but trust me, you will. It's yeah, orient me a little bit here. Right. So an SDS is a, a server. It's a thing that consumes storage and aggregates it and pools it and spreads it out. We started pretty small here. There's only six nodes. And a client is someone that's consuming it. It could be anything, mm -hmm. right? Now. What I've done is I've actually created a model for this new tenant. This is a storage pool. So this is the newly acquired company. This is our current environment. That's the target for our migration. Right. Now, just like any company, they've got their own app dev environment. They've got their management environment. They have their own OpenStack Cinder environment You know that is, again, Linux KVM. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at this and say, you know what? Let's add some uh, SDS nodes. So the first node I'm going to add 
Now these are just physical servers that I'm adding into the pool. I'm going to go and I'm going to give it a, an IP address, in fact two for redundancy. Okay, there's the first one, next one. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to add the physical devices. So these are local devices on that physical server. So this first one is a magnetic drive, so traditional old school HDD. And then we're going to add Flash. an SDD, exactly, an SSD, and then uh, individual uh, high performance PCI flash drive. I'm going to assign them for their different purposes. So this is an interesting idea of flexibility. You can actually use it for many different things. And I'm not just going to add one, I'm going to add a total of three nodes into the cluster, each with their own IP addresses. And what we're demonstrating here is frankly how easy it is. And of course, this can be automated via APIs. So you could script all this you if you want. You could script all of this. But what we're showing here is it's very, very easy to add physical nodes of all sorts of disparate configurations and different hardware. OK? And there we go. We're now done. Now. If I go and see, okay, are these being used? Because we we're actually presenting to the clients in advance. You can see, see the load coming in. Load is starting to ramp up, which is great. I noticed this is a chat optimized demo. I'm having to like <laughs> it's, really, you know, the world revolves around me, dude. <laughs> so look, uh, one thing that we found is that this concept for many people about software distributed, like where is what? How do I figure yeah. that out? Yeah. How do I see which nodes, you know, what, what I'm running is uh, is running on? This is our production database that is actually running for the pre-acquisition part of the company. You can actually go in and you can see how is this distributed across all of these SDS nodes. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that I think is really cool is there's deep abilities to look into things like device latencies. Mm. This is the internode latencies between each one of the SDS nodes that's serving up this particular right. environment. A couple of hundred microseconds. So what this also tells me is you think of software-defined storage on commodity, you think capacity optimized. And that would be ECS. Right. right? This, though, performance optimized. Performance optimized transactional. Very, very cool stuff. And actually, if we look here, we can see that we've gone up and we're now driving basically almost 80,000 IOPS. All right, so what, about 30% increase from what we had before? Exactly. And notice that the SDS node count increased. It's gone up by the three that you added. Right. Now, by the way, we've got a bit of a problem here, which is that the new acquired company is actually driving a fair amount of demand on the overall pool. So, so they potentially could be like a noisy neighbor. They right. could impact our system performance. So what we've got the ability to do is actually to apply unbelievably cool QoS policy. So here I'm doing it for the whole pool, and I'm saying, hey, 25 megabytes per second for each one of the SDS nodes for just that pool, that tenant. We can actually do this at the tenant level. We can actually do it at an individual workload level. And now you'll see that go from 300 down, 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 and so cool. really the kind of quality of services and the multi-tenancy, and, and actually the design point of Scale.io was much more for the SP world than anything. Right? And that's how our work actually started with Scale.io with our friends at Verizon. So interesting stuff. Now, if I go and I take a look at the dashboard, um, here we are, we're cooking along, everything is great. Uh, we're cooking. I noticed this rebuild thing. I guess we had a failure. One of the nodes is dead. So wait a minute, this could be the world's longest demo because I mean, it's going to take hours to rebuild. What's amazing is that the power of this distributed, performance-oriented scale I.O. model means that massive rebuild rates are possible. This is just a simple nine-node SDS. If it's 1,000 nodes, these rebuild rates go up well above gigabytes per second. Done already. That wasn't a rebuild of a drive. That was a rebuild of a node. A whole server needed to get rebuilt. And by the way, I'm relaxed. I know that actually the cluster is highly available the whole time, so incredibly, incredibly potent. So we're done? We're done. We just solved problem number two. So explain to me again. Give me the highlights. Scale I.O. You know, we just migrated all of our applications over from our acquired company. How can Scale I.O. do this so easily? So what we demonstrated is that this SDS model, with running software on commodity hardware, which is a kind of a platform three idea, mm -hmm. can be applied to platform two transactional workloads. Okay. We demonstrated the elasticity. So you can actually grow and shrink Scale I.O. clusters to infinity and beyond. We demonstrated that we could do it with rich, rich multi-tenancy, rich, rich openness. So again, it's the industry's only SDS layer that you could use with KVM, with Linux, bare metal, core OS, VMware. And I really think to date it's been almost the biggest secret 
inside the EMC portfolio. But if only we would do something like give it away for free for anyone here to use. Oh, wait a minute, we just did. So there's no excuse then for everyone in the room. They can take this today, they can download it, they can run it up, they can see what it can do for themselves. Exactly. Chad, well done, you're doing well. Two down, one to go. This is the big one because this is going to make an impact to our business. We've got streams of data, we've got information around consumers that we never thought we could have. Yep. We're going to get into the realm of big data analytics. Chad, this is going to be a real money spinner. Can you help? Dude, after those two, this one is a piece of cake. You know why? Why is that? Because we've been investing in a data lake, and I've got this monster 40 new node Apache Hadoop cluster running on DAS that will blow away your requirements. Oh, man. There's something going on over here. Who's that dude? <laughs> well, it's good to know that you have uh, 40 nodes of DAS there, Chad. But to tell the truth, that's like bringing a donut-fueled tricycle to race a Tesla. Oh, come on. <laughs> He's baiting you, man. <laughs> what you really need for doing high-speed analytics is something like rack scale flash. Rack scale flash? I think he's smoking something. <laughs> Indeed. And believe me, <laughs> it's good. So rack scale flash is exactly what it, the name sounds like. It's shared PCI connected flash that connects to a rack of servers to help you solve your high speed analytics workloads. And it used to be the case that in the Platform 2 and 2.5 worlds, that it was always your usual suspects that had these huge, monstrous, real-time data problems. Whether it's you know, the financial institutions doing their high-speed trading or whatever, your government agencies, or um, again, your standard HPC guys. Either way, you know, it was the usual suspects. However, today with Platform 3, with billions of connected devices out there, and even herds of cows generating all this data, what happens is that every company has this much data somewhere inside of it that it wants to analyze to get real answers to real business problems. So that's where Rack Scale Flash comes in. And what we've done is we've actually engineered a shared PCI connected fabric that connected, connects to a rack of servers and allows you to deliver the full potential of raw flash all the way to a shared environment. So you get all the benefits of PCI connected storage that is closer to the CPU in terms of memory hierarchy and faster and lower latency to help you get your job done while retaining all of the operational benefits of shared storage. That is, you have an easy service model, so your data is always available. Even if a server goes down, other servers can still access it. You have serviceability. You also have pooled storage and pooled capacity. All of the operational efficiencies you get from a shared appliance with all the performance advantages of a PCI connected storage array. So that's rack scale flash for you there, Chad. Uh, okay. I, Ed, you're in trouble here, buddy. No, 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 no. 40 node Hadoop cluster on DAS, man. And look, he's making stuff up. I, I don't know who to believe, but I think I know a way to what? settle this one. I what? know a way to settle it for once and for all. You're going now, down. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you thought you saw the big fight on Saturday night. But let's get ready to rumble! In the blue corner, weighing in at 155, 155, 155 <laughs> pounds. He drives a Honda. He drinks Red Bull. Chad Sackett. And in the green corner, weighing in at 230 pounds, he drives a Tesla, and his only weakness is the speed of light, Bill Moore. <laughs> Gentlemen, this is a world championship contest. It's one round of a hive transactional query. Keep it clean, gentlemen. All right, Chad, let's settle this like real men over a computer terminal. <laughs> So here we both have a nice web interface to do some uh, nice Hive analytics on a um, Hadoop cluster. I hear Chad's got this rockin' 40 node DAS. And over here we have, of course, a smaller system connected to rack scale flash. And uh, we'll just pull up some saved queries here. And on this first one here, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be querying Novium Healthcare's 50 terabyte database to figure out over the last 30 days 
or over the last several years, what conditions have caused the highest readmission rate in patients that have been seen in the last 30 days. So here you can see the query up on the screen, and just so that we have an idea of how much we're progressing, we'll bring up a little IOPS meter here. And uh, anytime you're ready there, Chad. On your marks, get set, you oh, go. Go? OK. Here we go. So Chad's over there with his 40 oh. nodes. I've got a paltry 10 nodes here. So. Dude, you're done, man. Look at this. I'm starting to ramp up. 2% progress. I'm Excellent. Gonna, Chad's in trouble. I think, uh, could I uh, maybe get a little extra um, time? Uh, uh, Chad, you're way behind, buddy. Well, Chad, I think your time's about... Oh, up. ladies and gentlemen, I think we have a winner. There oh. we go. I, Dude. How's it coming along there, Chad? Are you done yet? Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, it's, it's done. I think we would call that a technical knockout in the first <laughs> round. Bill, while we're waiting for Chad, I mean, it would be the right thing to do to let him finish, but while we're waiting for Chad, why don't we see some of the cool things that DSSD can do? Sure, so we got another save query here. Um, this one here is a lot more of a complex query, as you can see here. And what this is doing is, again, looking over the top four diseases, and again, this 50 terabyte database, trying to figure out amongst senior citizens what are the common diseases and syndromes that they see that are not present in the age group uh, 50 to 64. So once again, we'll bring up the little IOPS here, and we'll start that running. And uh, maybe we should check on Chad. See how Dude, yeah, Chad, are you finished? Please, yet? like, stop. I'm like right here. You know, this is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I've got a lot of friends in the audience. <laughs> Chad's almost at five percent. Go easy on me, fellas. Single digits? Wow. All right. I don't have your newfangled rack scale flash thing. And, and Bill, how many nodes are in your cluster, just as a matter of interest? Uh, about fifteen. Oh, so less than half of Chad's. Yeah. Well, you know. But how, we're done already. Yep. Hey, powerful things come in small packages, man. So, so, Bill, All right. <laughs> this is fantastic, but um, let's take a look under the cover, so to speak, inside this beast here. Oh. Certainly. So this is our uh, D5 storage appliance. Let me just turn it on here real quick. Press the button. So um, this 5U rack scale flash appliance um, has 36 flash modules in it. So today, that's 144 terabytes. Next year, that'll be 288 terabytes growing from there. And if you look at the front of this, you can see that we have 36 of these flash modules. Now, you can pull out these flash modules. And what these are is these are custom engineered flash modules. You buy raw NAND and engineer a flash module from scratch for that. Now, you may ask why we would do such a crazy thing like that. Yeah, Bill, why would you do such a crazy thing like that? <laughs> well, because we're crazy. But besides that, we actually have some real reasons. So if you look at raw NAND, it's you know, got a certain amount of capacity per die, but it also has a certain amount of potential performance per die. And unless you can actually power and cool the flash at scale, inside this one module, there's 512 NAND die. So even though each one only consumes a small bit of power, you multiply that out, that's 45 watts of power to drive the NAND at the performance potential it's capable of. So in addition to that, we wanted it to be hot pluggable, PCI connected, again, because that's the fastest, lowest latency interconnect right now on the planet. And there were no form factors out there that did that. So this is dual ported, PCI connected, hot pluggable, and highest performance thing that we have. And then up here, we have controller. Yeah, and un unlike traditional SSDs, where you're trying to, on these tiny little microprocessors, do wear leveling, do media management, do the flash translation layer, all of that takes horsepower to do right. And so what we did was we actually migrated all of those complex algorithms up to a dual socket um, Intel motherboard that we put into our server here, where we can run far more complex algorithms and do a far more better job, again, at the system level, not just at a single SSD level. So we can make optim optimal choices across all 36 modules rather than looking through a SOTA straw and trying to optimize it only on a single module. And then I know there's really cool stuff under the covers here. So can we That's pull it right. apart and take a look inside of, of this switch? Of course we can. So as part of this, since it's all PCI connected, what we had to do is we had to figure out how to make the world's largest PCI fabric to connect these 48 servers to all of these PCI flash modules. And this is it. You see each of these little black triangles. There's actually 12 of them. Some are hidden here. Each one is a 64-lane PCI switch. So this is the largest PCI fabric anyone has ever built before. And the reason that's necessary is because on one side, you have 48 cables going to your rack of servers. 
each one of these cables is a PCI Gen 3 by 4, so capable of 4 gigabytes a second. And then we have 48 of these on a single module, fanning out to the 36 modules in front so they can all be aggregated and consumed as a whole. And that's how you get the direct connect but shared storage. Exactly right. And of course, there's two of these, this being an enterprise product, you have to be able to have redundancy and resiliency and serviceability. So there's two of these, each server connects to both sides for full resiliency and redundancy. Now, now Bill, um, when people think fast, I think to date they probably think memory, or they might think SSDs. Um, That's right. Everyone, I, mean, I think we're dying to know, how does this stack up against SSDs or even memory? Well, that's a good question. We actually um, asked that question of ourselves early in the project. And what we did was we wrote a uh, benchmarking program. And what this benchmarking program does is it does 128,000 random 32 KIOs to whatever device you pointed at. So here, let me connect this to um, a server here. And what this is going to do is it's going to do these random IOs over a four terabyte data set. And that's actually going to start from 16 gig and go to four terabytes. And you can run it here and see how this goes. Now, in the interest of time here, we've actually made this such that we can accelerate this, but this is real data that we collected. And as you can see, in order to do these random IOs, DRAM is pretty fast in the order of seconds. Mm -hmm. And there you go. And that's now, what we typically think of as probably the, um, almost certainly the fastest. Indeed, it is fast, but it's also volatile. So right. not exactly the best place to keep data that you want to analyze later. All right, so here we go for SSDs. And now with SSDs, you can see that it's taking a little bit longer, and the dots are moving slower. So here, let me accelerate that again. And again, you can see for doing the same workload that took seconds in memory, it actually took over a minute to do on fast SSDs. So now everyone is dying to see, all right, show us uh, D5, and where is that going to fit? Indeed. So here we connect to a D5, and we'll see how it sort of winds up in the middle here. And as you can see, it's much closer to the memory speed because, again, it's connected directly to the CPU through PCI Express. And that's how we can get closer to memory speeds than any SSDs on the but planet. I think most people find a bit of a shocker because I would have expected somewhere in the middle, you know, when you talked about bridging this gap, you think, all right, you're kind of hitting the middle ground, but actually much closer to memory. That's right. And that's because, again, we can aggregate so many NAND devices in a small appliance and get that density and get that performance through that PCI fabric. So now, net this out for us, you know, business value of DSSD, um, you know, give us the, the bottom line. Yeah, well, it's essentially you can analyze your workloads and get results you know, way faster at a much better cost of ownership because you're able to get them faster. You know, take example, you know, a healthcare industry, right? They're trying to match you know, a custom drug to a particular patient's genome to see what works best for them. Right now, that takes 11 days to run that query because it's such a massive data set. And if you're a stage four cancer patient, you might not have 11 days. So being able to do that same analysis in a matter of hours is truly a life-saving skill. Yeah, it truly could be uh, saving lives. Um, speaking of saving lives, I've just noticed out the corner of my eye over there, Chad is looking pretty hot and bothered. Um, I, he's also using the Medi app. I think we, is there a way we can see his you know, state of being at this I, point, Bill, just to finish with? Well, I'm not happy about this, man. <laughs> So in an always connected world, of course, you can do analytics on people even when they're right in front of you, right, Chad? Oh, jeez. All right. Okay, we'll log in here. Chad, the new Medi app. This is our analytic front end that we've been working on. That's uh, right. So this has been analyzing what Chad's been up to the last couple of days, collecting data on him. And it looks here like 1.30 uh, a.m. there was a little irregular cardio rhythm. You it wasn't remember? irregular, baby. Win it at the craps table. <laughs> All right. Well, we're glad to hear that, Chad. And uh, let's see what else. It says below recommended level of sleep. It says here you've been only getting about 3.2 hours of sleep there, Chad. What's Your up? Your system is wrong. That is not abnormal. That is normal EMC world sleep cycles. <laughs> <laughs> well, even Red Bull and donuts can only get you so far, Chad. Oh, wait a minute. Something bad's going on here. Chad. Good morning. Regular cardio rhythm detected. Are you okay, Chad? I feel okay, but this thing is saying call 911. Uh, what is that all about? Chad, how do your arms feel? My, I, my left arm feels a little funny. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's got big problems here. I've, yeah, I've, look at his heart rate. It's escalating. Can we get I, some help? Chad, I, you need help. I don't need any stinking help from you, Mr. Rackscale Flash. Oh, man. All it's right. time to say goodbye to Chad. Ladies and gentlemen, Chad Sakach. Rematch. Next EMC World.
I kind of feel sorry for the guy. I mean, Bill, like, it could be the end of his career. Yeah, well, I'm sure he'll figure this out sooner or later. So, but again, with uh, higher performance analytic capabilities, I think Chad will figure out a way to recover. I think he'll figure out. All right, well, look, ladies and gentlemen, Bill Moore, CEO of DSSD. Bill, thank you very much. All right, I'd better get checking on Chad. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. S seems like Bill's got some work to do reviving Chad backstage. He doesn't look healthy on that picture. Okay, wrapping up then. What are we talking about today? We have a great business today, Platform 2, transitioning to Platform 2.5. You've heard about you know, many of those products over the last couple of days. But I hope what you take away today is we are absolutely fixated on not just continuing to lead in the second platform, but bringing the right talent, the right technologies to lead in the third platform. Again, key attributes, scale out, software defined, open source, rack scale flash. You know, they run through everything that we're going to be doing. So the final thing that I need to do, obviously here, to keep everybody happy, is make a determination who is gonna win the 50 Apple Watches. So, on the click of this mouse, if you see your name up on the screen, you have won an Apple Watch. I have no idea where you go to collect them. <laughs> it's like a detail I forgot. They'll be in the mail. <laughs> Trust us, everything's going to be OK. So the winners are, OK, I've been told you meet in the front. If your name's on the uh, slide here, you meet down the front. And I'm sure we'll send you a We Owe You an Apple Watch. Ladies and gentlemen, check out the screens. Thank you for being a great audience today. We'll see you next time. Thank you. All right, everybody, so that concludes our general sessions. We will be back in here at 8 o'clock this evening for the concert. Enjoy your day of sessions. Go check out the village. Thank you very much for joining us today.